this time I will invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and all-sufficient word. We're reading in Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we've just come to the end of the longest sentence in the Greek New Testament, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, 12 verses, one sentence. In the Greek, it's a little bit more grammatically acceptable to have a lengthy sentence building on one another like that. But what that sentence illustrated was Paul's just what I would call an effusive praise, an effusive delight and celebration of God and what God has done for his people. He opens by saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And then he unpacks those spiritual blessings, God's plan from eternity past to choose a people for himself, to be holy and blameless before him, to predestine us, to be adopted as sons in relationship to him, to put forward his son as a redemption, a ransom for our redemption, to provide the forgiveness of our sins, to lavish his grace on us, to make known to us his wisdom and insight, and to give us an inheritance in Christ, and to seal us with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of that inheritance. Just an effusive worship and praise for the glory and the goodness of God and what he's done for us through redemption. Having concluded that, he now goes to the second longest sentence in the Greek New Testament. I don't know if it's the second longest, but it's another sentence. Verses 15 through 23. But now he's turning to prayer. And Paul is praying for his recipients, the church at Ephesus. He does this in nearly every single one of his letters he writes. It is an example of pastoral care for the people that he is shepherding, he is loving. This is how we care for one another. We pray for people. I pray for you. I pray, and I trust that you pray for me and pray for one another in your church. And as we look at this prayer, I, I desire, my aim is that we would learn from his example of prayer. I pray that we would be a praying church. And if we're going to be people who pray, this is the kind of prayer that we would incorporate in our prayer life. So today, looking at verses 15 through 19, we're looking at the motivation for prayer, the posture of prayer, and the content of prayer. Lord willing, I could be brief on the first two so we could spend more time on that last one because I think that is really where the the richness comes through, the content of prayer. But let's start with the motivation for a prayer. Paul begins right here in verse 15. He explains why is he praying? He says, for this reason. Those words, I believe, are looking backwards. He's looking back at this praise of God, the glory of God, the goodness of God, the work of God, the redemption of God. Because God is so good, because God has blessed us, because God has worked out all things according to the counsel of his will, I pray. So the first motivation to prayer is God. If we know God, we understand God, if we believe in his goodness and his blessings he gives us, it would draw us into prayer. That's why the study of God, the knowing of God, is so vital as a foundation for our fellowship and communion and prayer to God. Because God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, we have encouragement to come and say, God, 
Help us enjoy these blessings. Live out in these blessings. Work these blessings out in my life. Because I have the forgiveness of sin through Christ. I could come to him in prayer confessing my sin. It's a guaranteed blessing, the forgiveness of my sin. I don't need to hide. I could be open and transparent with God. God is singular. Sing, that's a hard word for me to say. It, he is alone the greatest motivation to pray. I think of the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4 when he speaks about Christ. He says at the end of chapter 4, since we have such a great high priest, namely Jesus Christ, who has passed through the heavens, let us therefore with confidence come before the throne of grace, seeking mercy and grace in the time of need. Because of who Christ is, because of what God has done, we can have confidence. We are drawn to pray. If you feel like your prayer life is stagnant, if you feel like your prayer life is even dry and dead, perhaps you don't know God as well as you should. If you would think about God, meditate on these verses, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Commit them to memory. They would draw you out to be a person of prayer. That's the first motivation. The second motivation we see in verse 16. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in all my prayers. I'm sorry. That's, that's the posture of prayer. It's, the second motivation is still in verse 15. I'm getting a little excited over Jumping the gun here. Back to verse 15. So he says, for this reason, that's backward looking. But then he says, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I, I love the fact that Brett took the time to introduce two of our missionaries we support, John Dunning, John Cropsey, these missionary families. I love the fact that you interacted with them this week and you could share a report from them. But isn't that interesting? When we hear a report of somebody, it draws us out to pray for them. This is the second motivation. That it is human need. So if the first motivation for prayer is God, the goodness of God. He is a, a trustworthy God. He's a great God. He could bless us richly. The second motivation is human need. We hear a report from John and Tricia Dunning and their ministry amongst college students on the K-State campus. And there's need there. There's great need there. They're bringing the hope of the gospel to a generation of students on campus who are feeling that burden and the weight of an academic calendar. Lord, help us love these students well. Help us minister to them well. Even their needs specifically for their own daughter, Lucy, now who is a freshman in college. And understanding our daughter is growing up. She's becoming an adult. She's becoming independent. If any of you have traveled that road as a parent, Lord, have mercy, help. What do I do? You thought, some of you in, with toddlers, you think that's hard. Just wait. Just wait. Human need is a motivation for prayer. And that's what Paul is reflecting here. When I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, you think, well, there's no need being expressed there. Well, there is. Because Paul understands humans. Their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for the saints is not a slam dunk guarantee they're good. Let's forget about them. This is a church that he helped plant. He spent two to three years with. He preached the gospel among them. He saw a great revival occur in their midst where they came and confessed sin and burned their magic books. He saw this great work of the Spirit in their midst. He baptized some of them. He knows of their faith. He knows of the, the growth in their, their walk with the Lord. And yet... He's still praying for them. Why? Because he knows their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for the saints will only endure and sustain through the preservation of God himself. Our faith 
is fragile. We'll come to that even more clearly, more explicitly. I love the fact that John gave this illustration. We're going we're to talk about that snowball, snow boulder. We can't lift it. We talk about salvation. We can't save ourselves, right? We can't die for our sins. We can't do enough to earn salvation. It is a free gift. We start with that free gift, but we continue and sustain as a free gift. It's not our strength. It's not our power. It's not our abilities. And so Paul, hearing of their faith and their love for the saints, knows for that to continue, he needs to continue to pray for them. The motivation for prayer, God in human need. Uh, that's a tangent. I got to let that go. Just a thought popped in my mind. John Calvin and a quote, and I'm like, ah. The posture of prayer. This is verse 16. Now we get to read this verse. So he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. What an incredible example of the posture. What, not physical posture, but the attitude, the, the inner spirit. How do we approach prayer? Number one, we approach it with this urgency. Or perhaps you could say it's a desperation. Why does Paul say, I do not cease? Because he's, he knows that desperation. I think of the, the parable in Luke 18 of the persistent widow who's seeking justice from the unjust judge. He's annoyed with her. But she is persistent, banging on his door, give me justice against my opponents. And finally, he says, Jesus quotes the judge, it's not because I care about this widow. It's not because I care about justice even, but because she is annoying me, I will give her justice. And Jesus uses an example. It's an argument from the lesser to the greater, by far the lesser to the far greater God himself. If the unjust judge gives to this woman who's persistent, how much more will God give to his own children? That's why Paul is unceasing. This is the posture of desperation. I need God. I, you need God. I will pray unceasingly for you because there's no other hope. That's that posture of prayer, this desperation. But the second posture here is this gratitude. He speaks about with thanksgiving. I have ringing in my mind, Dr. George Sweeting gave a whole sermon called The Attitude of Gratitude and how it is the key mark of a faithful follower of Christ. It's the lack of gratitude that leads us into all kinds of mess. But here it is, involved in prayer, part of our posture of prayer is a gratitude, being thankful, understanding that what, what do we enjoy, what do we have that we have not received? 1 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul says. What do we have that we have not received? Or James 1, 17. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Everything we have is a gift. So if we're desperate, this posture of desperation, I, I have nowhere else to go. God's my only hope. I'm trusting in you. And gratitude, this humble thankfulness. Lord, you have blessed me so richly. I lack nothing, but I'm I need your help in this moment. Help me. That's the posture of prayer. This desperation and gratitude. What's the content? This is the focus here, verse 17 through 19. You've never seen me get to the third point of a sermon faster. <laughs> I succeeded. Verse 17, this is the content. This is what he's praying. That... The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, it actually doesn't, yeah, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In a nutshell, he is praying for knowledge. Saying, I pray that you would have knowledge. 
that you would have the spirit of wisdom. I think he's speaking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to give this wisdom, this insight in knowing God, knowing his ways, knowing his work for us, of revelation, revealing the truth of all that God has already done, primarily through the word of God and how the spirit works, in the knowledge of him, the knowledge of God. This is the number one prayer that Paul gives for the people he writes to. A couple of examples here. Again, here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he's going to pray something similar. In verse chapter 3, verses 14 and following, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, jumping ahead to verse 17, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We'll come to this in a few months, chapter 3, but he's praying for their comprehension and their knowing of the love of God, which inexplicably surpasses knowledge, but I'm praying that you would know this love that surpasses knowledge. Paul prays for knowledge. Again, in Philippians 1, 9, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge in all discernment. Knowledge is important to Paul. Colossians 1.9, he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with knowledge, the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I think of 2 Peter 1.3, where Peter writes, All things pertaining to life and godliness have been granted to you through the knowledge of him who gave himself up for you. Knowledge. The, the Greek word is a very special word, epinosis. It is not a textbook knowledge. It's not sitting down at your biology book and memorizing all the vis various things. I didn't do very well in biology. All the various things that you learn in biology. And you can memorize them and, and from memory, chatter them off. You can, you can memorize scripture. And that's the, not the knowledge he is praying for us. Memory of scripture is good. Memory of scripture might serve this knowledge. But when he uses this Greek word, epinosis, he's speaking about an experience. A relational dynamic of knowing this person. There's a reason Paul, you got to think about Paul as a Jew, first century, trained as a Pharisee. He would have studied his Old Testament. Some say the Pharisees even memorized the entire Old Testament, knew it frontwards to backwards. They studied Hebrew. And so they would bring that into, even in their Greek writing for the New Testament church, have that influence. And so he would read, for example, Genesis 4, and Adam knew Eve. This is not a textbook knowledge of a husband and a wife. This is not just, oh, I know she has blonde hair, uh, she wears glasses, uh, she likes Chipotle on Sundays after church, she uh, goes to sleep at 10 p.m. It's not things like that. It is an intimate communion, knowing one another, of of a relational commitment and connection to one another. That's why it says right after that, Adam knew Eve and they had a son, Seth. That's knowledge. Seth was third, but you get the point. This is what Paul is praying, that you would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, that you would know God, that you would be in a communion with Him through Scripture, have this fellowship and enjoyment of a relationship with God where you are known and you know Him. For that is the place where true spiritual vitality, true spiritual renewal, spiritual growth, spiritual energy springs out of transformation to know God. Jesus says in John 17, verse 3, and this is to know God. Wait, sorry, back up. This is eternal life. This is eternal life. 
to know you, the Father, and him whom you have sent. To know this life, the qualitative, not necessary quantity, a qualitative life, a life with the Father. It's to know God and to know the Son. That's Paul's prayer. Let me ask you, when's the last time you prayed for knowledge? To know God. Harry Ironside was a preacher and pastor early 20th century. When he was young in his ministry, met an older gentleman that had served faithfully the Lord in ministry for decades. It was approaching near the end of his life. He had tuberculosis, was having a hard time speaking, but Harry Ironside visited with him. And, and the, the older gentleman asked, I, I understand that you are a minister, you're a pastor. And Harry Ironside said, yes, I, I am. And this older gentleman said, let's open Scripture together and let's revel in the goodness of God. And he went from passage to passage to passage to passage to passage, just speaking about the goodness of God from the Scripture. And Harry Ironside, as a, a young minister, having gone through seminary, he's like, how, how, do you, how do you come to know Scripture? How, can you, how, can you, how have you come to know God in such a deep, passionate, intimate way? Was it through a seminary class, a Bible college? And this older gentleman responded, it's nothing you learn in seminary. It's nothing you learn in a Bible class. You learn it on your knees, begging the Lord to open the eyes of your hearts, to give you this knowledge and knowing Him. There's one sense you can memorize this book and still not know God. There is a, a place where we are, going back to that posture of prayer, desperate and thankful. Lord, I need to know you. Help me to know you. Open my eyes so I might behold glorious things in your word. I want to know you. That's where spiritual vitality, spiritual life, spiritual growth, transformation comes in fellowship, communion, knowing God. Do you pray for knowledge of God? That's why I wanted to spend time on content here. I know, I know what I pray for oftentimes. Pray for my family, pray for physical needs, pray for health, pray for financial situations, even on a, a world scheme of conflicts being resolved, wars to cease. But it's through the knowledge of God, that, that place where we're communing with Him, that's where the power is. That's where life happens. Now, he gets specific. Three items he prays that we would know specifically. So there is a general knowledge of God, and that is filled with all the scripture. How, what do we know of God? And we can spend a lifetime on our knees praying, Lord, help me know you and enjoy you and fellowship with you. But Paul gets specific. He says in verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, very similar prayer request that the spirit of wisdom and revelation is given to you. Eyes of your hearts are enlightened that you may know Three things. What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Let's take those three in turn. Why, why these three? What are these three? What is Paul praying for, for the church at Ephesus? So the hope to which he has called you, literally in the Greek, it's just the hope of his call. The call produces the hope. You're not called to hope. The call produces hope. So hope is a confidence, an assurance that everything is going to be okay in the future. But that hope springs from this call. What is the call of God? In biblical terms, the call of God is the work of God's Spirit. Awakening 
in our hearts a sense of contrition, brokenness over our sin, awakening in our hearts a, a longing and a desire for Christ to trust Him, believing that He is our Savior. That is the call of God. It is the special work of the Spirit to, to take out a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, to make us alive together with Christ, to give us a desire to respond in faith to the truth of the gospel. That is the call of God. Theologically, it is the foundation of our relationship with God. No one responds in faith to God apart from God calling us, drawing us, bringing us to himself. In Romans 8.30, Paul says this, those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. That's the theological understanding of the call. This is God's work of awakening us, bringing us to that place. So we place our faith in Christ, and by faith we are justified, counted righteous in the sight of God. We are saved. That's the call. Now the Bible speaks about another call. Perhaps we often associate and think about this. This is the call that Jesus gives in Matthew 11. The word call is not there, but it is a call. All who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and find rest. That is a call. It's an invitation. But no one responds to the invitation unless God, by his spirit, has called in our hearts to awaken that sense, I need rest, and Jesus is the one who gives me that rest. What is the hope of that call? The hope is that we're forgiven, that we've been saved, that our sins are washed as white as snow, that we have a relationship, a reconciled relationship with our Creator God, and He counts us as His precious children, and we, His, He is our Father. That is the hope of that call, a restored relationship with God. Think about the implications of that. If the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened so that we might know the hope of his call on us, there is such incredible peace. The acceptance of God engulfing us in his love and care for us, knowing that we are his children, 1 John 3, 1, behold, what manner of love the Father has for us, that we should be called the children of God. So we are. That's the hope of that call. We can have the most miserable day, whether it's your own sinful inclinations have caused you to stumble and fall and fail, or you can have the worst news of physical illness, sickness, and you come and know the hope of your call. There is incredible comfort and peace there. The second thing, he prays, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? We spent quite a bit of time last week talking about this inheritance. Verse 11, he says, we have obtained an inheritance. And we talked about the reality that we are the inheritance, and so God is an inheritor. We are his heritage, his people, his possession, his precious. But also, we have an inheritance, which it says in verse 14, the Spirit is a guarantee of our inheritance. And that inheritance is future-oriented, looking ahead to the new heavens and the new earth, or what we could say is new creation, where this mortal body, this perishable body, this corrupted with sin body, where we could cry out, Lord, who will save me from this body of sin? On that day, in that inheritance, this mort mortal body puts on immortality. This perishable body puts on imperishable body. And the corruption of sin is completely removed. I'm made new, and I have sweet, whole affections for the Lord. That is the riches 
of the inheritance. So praying, Lord, may, may the eyes of my heart be enlightened so I might know the riches of these inheritance, this inheritance. That has a sanctifying, a purifying work in our hearts today. It weans us from the love of this world and the things of this world. Because all that I could ever long for, all that I could ever desire is promised for me and held secure and will give, be given to me. So why do I get lost and get caught up in so much lesser pleasures that really don't satisfy? The third thing he prays for is this power. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? Paul is using every single synonym in the Greek language to talk about power. The, the ESV doesn't communicate it as well. So you have dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. That's the word for power. He's praying that we would know the measurable greatness of his power toward us who believe that is according to the working. This is the Greek word, an aragon, where we get the word energy. The working, the energy of God, of his great, Greek word there is the word for strength. The strength of his might. These are four synonyms, all speaking about the same thing as power, his working, his energy, his strength, and his might. I think what Paul is just trying to, in a beautiful, poetic way, just lay on us is that God's power is what sustains us, what upholds us. It's God's power that's going to move the snow boulder, not ours. By whose power did you become a Christian? By whose power did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? By whose power are you walking faithfully with the Lord today? By whose power will you overcome any sin or temptation? By whose power will you remain faithful and steadfast till the day of Christ Jesus? By whose power? It's only God's power. It's only God's power. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all, above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? To have a humble understanding of our own human heart, our own human condition, leads us to this place and saying, it's not my power. It's not my power that brought me to faith. It's not my power that holds me in Christ today. I'm not being held in Christ. It's not my power that's going to overcome sin and temptation. It's not my power that's going to hold me until the day of Christ Jesus. It's God's power. I, I'm dependent on his power. And it's ours. Notice that he doesn't pray that you would receive power. He's praying that the eyes of your hearts might be enlightened so that you might know the immeasurable greatness of his power that is yours for who believe. I have a little pet peeve I'll share with you. I've heard some people use the language of so-and-so is a strong Christian. If you've used that, I'm not here to disparage you. I'm sorry if but my pet peeve with this idea of that person's a strong Christian, that person is, they're a strong Christian. Use that to describe Christian. According to Scripture, I don't see any description of a Christian being called strong. There are no strong Christians. There are either weak Christians who know they are weak and are humbly dependent and desperate for the power of God that's sustaining them, upholding them. And then there are weak Christians who are foolishly ignorant of their dependency on the Lord and trying to uphold and 
sustain their life on their own. There's no strong Christian. And I know why some people use that phrase and what they're referring to, so I'm not going to overly disparage it, but let's put the emphasis, let's put the strength, let's put the power, not on us, but on God. There is no strong Christian, but there is a strong God. And Paul prays, and I encourage you, make this your prayer. Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might know the power, the measurable greatness of your power toward me as I believe, being upheld, being sustained, being carried by the strength of your great might, the working of your great might. I'm utterly dependent. Help me to see my dependency. That's where we see God begin to work and bring renewal and transformation. Turn our eyes off ourselves, eyes fixed on the Lord. He begins to work. It's been in the news for a couple weeks now, this what some are called a revival at Asbury University in Kentucky. Some have jumped on the social media or in various blogs or opinion pieces to either denounce it and say, well, that's not a revival or say, absolutely, that's a revival. I'm not here to do either. I want revival. I want to be revived. I want my church to be revived. I want my family to be revived. I want to see the the work of the Spirit in our lives, renewing and energizing us. And if that's what God is doing there amongst those college students, praise God. I pray that the fruit of that would be born and, and multiply. But as I know from Scripture, as I know right here, this is a prayer for revival. For the church at Ephesus, for the church in Shawnee, Oak Hills, we're, we're not location based. You're all over Shawnee and Johnson County and Kansas City Metro. I, I pray for you that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, you may know what is the hope of his call in your life, the riches of his inheritance among the saints and the measurable greatness of his power toward you who believe according to the working of his strong might. As the Lord pleases and draws near to us and we know him through his kindness Revival comes. That's why I pray for it. I invite you to be praying with me. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are dependent on you. We need you. And thank you for reminders and teaching. Thank you for that. You are a God who's available. You're not a God who's hiding. A God who's playing games with us. You are making yourself available. You have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And now you invite us to just pray, Lord, open the eyes of our hearts to see these blessings, rest in these blessings, to revel in these blessings, to trust in these blessings. May we rest in your power, not ours. May May we enjoy your inheritance and the riches you have for us and not fight for other riches. May we find a hope, our identity, our significance, and the calling you've placed on our lives to be your children. Bless your people. Bring that renewal, that restoration, even revival amongst us. In Christ's name, amen.